Stormer Man. Mr. Bob? We've got to do a summary video of your last live stream. I don't know. For whatever reason, they weren't able to watch it. One of the best forms of self-care is helping others. These videos help others to explore ideas to do just that. Stop being so selfish, Jeremy. Alright, I'll be there in a minute. And on and on we'll go. Hi, Jeremy here from veganinteractions.com. And in the next five minutes or so, I'm going to try to answer the question of whether or not human issues are relevant to campaigning for our fellow animals, as well as maybe try to answer the question of whether or not the left can work with the right and vice versa. Now, two weeks ago, I did a live stream with um, Jasmine, known as Vegan Ariel, on YouTube. And it was a full-on chat. I mean, we covered loads of different topics. And I'm not going to try to cover them all here. <laughs> I have no idea how I'm going to compress this into a 10-minute video. Also, due to a mic issue, Jasmine's sound didn't come through all that great. So rather than play clips for this, like I normally might, I'll focus on my individual observations and do the best to represent the whole situation fairly. Now these new live streams of mine, um, the Vegan Interactions Live, are a bit of a, an experiment and Jasmine was the first willing participant. So I'm really appreciative to her to reaching out because I think oftentimes these conversations happen in comment sections where they're much less likely to be productive. Now to start the chat off, something that I'm probably going to keep doing for future live streams is rather than asking someone for their so-called vegan story that we hear all too often, I'm asking them about their um, activist story and how they became active. I think this will be a great way to explore our own individual journey to activism and hopefully empower others to think about how they can stand up for our fellow animals. Now when Jasmine and I did this, she talked about how she got into activism actually as a way to meet fellow animal advocates. And I talked about how when I started to get active, I was actually in Singapore at the time. So I couldn't really do street outreach. So instead I did a water only fast. You probably don't want to know how many days I did, do you? It was 22, but I promise I don't drink my own urine. So yeah, I think as a bit of a side note, I think it'd be cool if when we meet fellow vegans if we ask them how they got active and if it turns out they're not active we could talk about how to tap into their potential um, and tap into their where, where their skills and passion might lie and help empower them to get active too. Okay so on to the main topic. I will do my best to compress this incredibly complex conversation into less than five minutes. Bob can we get a timer on the clock please? Timer on the clock? What does that even mean? Timer on the clock. The clock has a timer. That's what makes it a clock. Bob can we get five minutes on the clock please? Do I want it there? Bob, can we get five minutes on the clock, please? Now, when we start off with framing the conversation, I um, clarified that I actually don't gravitate that much towards the term intersectionality in general, because I don't think it's that accurate. I prefer to talk about entanglement or um, overlapping of different issues. And I also talked about how it's not so much about these um, different issues being analogous. They're actually part of the same thing, reinforce each other. And that from a species perspective, humans try to um, animalize um, the targeted group, as well as from the perspective of our fellow animals, where they strip them of their individuality and how they often reduce them to the status of objects or property. Now, I also talked about the construction of the so-called intersectional and how demonizing intersectionals effectively demonizes the ideas, which I think is a bit similar to how people demonize just another vegan to help swerve the topic of veganism. And we also looked at it both from a theoretical or a big picture idea perspective, as well as the practicable applications. Now, from a vegan perspective, the definition does include humans. And we talked about how it was a bit ambiguous that this could just mean an offshoot of respecting our fellow animals, or it could gesture at a bigger relationship there. It's not entirely clear. From the perspective of the philosophy of animal rights, we talked about how humans all share with our fellow animals these so-called animal rights. We all have the basic moral right to not be bred, used, or killed. And then human rights is stacked on top of that. So there is a relationship between human rights and the rights of our fellow animals. Another thing I wanted to raise from a theoretical perspective is that the originator of non-rhetorical animal rights, Tom Reagan, spoke to this relationship often, specifically talking about how they're cut from the same moral cloth. He also spoke of how the animal rights movement is part of, not antagonistic to, the human rights movement. We also talked about the practical applications and how human issues can relate to our campaigning for our fellow animals. The first and most obvious is probably that our target audience is humans. So if we're trying to motivate them and empower them to have the capacity to change, we've got to be aware of their issues too. Also, there's loads of objections that I think having a broader awareness of human issues can help us to combat. For instance, if someone comes at us with the whole, you vegans only care about the animals, we can respond back that 
at 25,000 humans starving each and every day, if we were feeding the um, plants directly to humans versus filtering them through our fellow animals, veganism actually goes a long way to helping humans as well. And I think for those who want to have a more rights-based discussion, if someone says, you know, the whole animals don't have rights thing, we can talk about, well, do you think humans have rights? And then start to bridge the species gap to why our fellow animals have a valid claim to basic moral rights too. Now there's a whole lot wrapped up in this, and I'm not going to be able to address it all here, certainly not in the summary video. But I think the key thing for me is talking about the whole concept of focus versus scope, and that the focus will always be on our fellow animals, while the scope has all these other things swirling around the outside of that, which includes human issues, as well as the environment and the world we live in. And that knowledge of the scope can help us to better campaign for our focus. Now this is where the water gets a lot muddier, because I think there's a lot of different ways to apply these concepts. The key to me is just to not dismiss the concepts altogether. I also think this focus scope framing is quite specific. We don't just throw this concept out there and then talk about everything willy-nilly. To me, I think the focus should give, be given 80-90% of our time, and the scope should really only come up when it's relevant, and then we redirect back to the focus. Because I think if we spend too much time on the scope, the animal-centric focus on the individual might get lost. And to me, that's the key to building the respect for our fellow animals. We also talked about how, at a minimum level, I was making the suggestion that even if we don't campaign for human issues, we should at least do our best not to be antagonistic towards them, because that'll ultimately push people away from respecting our fellow animals too. And that was one of the really surprising takeaways for me from this conversation, because I honestly think we should try to swerve politics and human issues when it's practicable to do so, because I think it's going to lead to more disagreement and we're less likely to achieve our objective. Now, of course, if we come across something um, overtly oppressive, we should call that out and challenge it. Now, the cool thing from this conversation is I think we actually agreed that human issues are relevant. Now, as far as how we apply this relationship to our animal advocacy, that's a much bigger discussion. And to be honest, I kind of swerved it during our live stream because I thought it could be a distraction, very similar to how I think it could be a distraction during our vegan outreach. I think when politics does come up, though, I think a good way to think of it is that animal rights is political, but perhaps nonpartisan, because we also talked about how no political party really holds a true animal rights position. And of course, there's the subsidies topic we could bring up. So the key takeaways for this conversation for me were there's this whole myriad of complex topics happening in the world that, to be honest, came up in our live stream too, and it would have been really easy to engage with them. But I'm glad I didn't because I think we were able to stay focused on the key task, which was to find common ground, and hopefully we can build from there. This conversation was also enlightening, enlightening to me because regardless of where we fall on the perspective of supporting intersectionality to um, cursing at it every time we see the I word come up, that when it comes to the practical applications, we're actually pretty similar in the ways that matter. This conversation also reiterated to me that it takes nothing away from our animal advocacy to be more mindful of human issues, and in fact it could actually help strengthen our campaigning for our fellow animals. This conversation also reminded me how these conversations would be incredibly difficult to have over a comment section. I mean, can you think back to a time on social media where you've had a disagreement with someone that's perhaps text-based? What if you could have just picked up the phone and talked to that person live? Which is why I'm, I'm really thankful to Jasmine for to reaching out to make this conversation happen. Because I think the more we talk to other people, the more we'll understand where others are coming from. Another thing I gestured at trying to address in this video, which I'll probably just touch on to be honest, is the whole idea of whether or not the left and the right can work together when it comes to the idea of animal advocacy. Now this is a topic that I'd like to explore in future live streams more fully, but the way I'd like to look at it is there's a whole scope of animal advocates around the world with a whole lot of different views on a whole lot of different topics. Some we may never know exist, and others we might go out onto the street with every single day. And there's a whole lot of room in between. We don't necessarily have to work with all of them. Now where someone falls in that spectrum isn't so much as important as recognizing that we're all animal advocates and finding ways to work together in the ways that make sense. Because a big thing we talked about during this live stream is how people get pushed into these echo chambers and all of a sudden we're not talking to each other and evolving our ideas. We're kind of just repeating the same things to each other. For instance, this live stream that I did with Jasmine, I know I learned a whole lot, so I think we're going to be a whole lot more diverse as a movement if we're willing to have these conversations where we might not necessarily agree with someone on everything, but we can find the ways that we do agree, while still being mindful to call out disrespectful and oppressive behavior when it's necessary to do so. 
So in summary, this conversation gave me a lot of hope because I think if we look at the animal advocates from around the world as a bit of a Venn diagram, we probably have a lot of people that we um, agree with, a lot who we don't agree with, and maybe there's some overlap in between of the people that we can work with. Okay, so it looks like I went over my five minutes, but hopefully Bob's all right with that. Bob, you cool? I'll let it go this time, but don't let it happen again. So do please like, comment, subscribe to see upcoming content. Um, I've got a few live streams in the works that are going to be super exciting. One of which is with my sister, Allison, who some of you may know from the recent Rescue Story video I did. And the word on the street is we might have some live interviews with the stars of the rescue story of her feathery family. And please do share this with uh, fellow animal advocates who you think would benefit from exploring this topic further, because I don't really do this channel to become a YouTube influencer or anything like that, which is probably why I'm not but I do think these are ideas and conversations worth getting out there. I am trying to release a new video every Sunday night as consistently as I can. Thanks for watching and all you do for our fellow animals, and I'll see you in the next one. I've got to find a replacement for Bob. For free resources, such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com. Thanks for watching.